Greetings from the End Time Apostolic Christian Holiness Church, located at 650 South Warren Avenue in Columbus, Ohio, where Jesus is Lord and our pastor is Bishop Dr. Derek A. Reeves. Due to COVID-19 restrictions, our order of services have changed and are as follows. Sunday School at 9 a.m. Sunday Morning Worship at 11 a.m. Our weekday services, Tuesday, Bible study at 6 p.m. Wednesday, prayer at 7 p.m. Our services will be available via Zoom and Facebook Live. Let us join in as the Word of God comes forth that is able to heal, save, and deliver. And so I want to come from the book, I, I feel him today. So I, I want you to pray, God, for my strength today. But uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 16. Matthew 4 and 16. You can remain seated. I'm going to read it into your hearing. I'm going to need you when we have to call on him and praise him today. Again, Matthew chapter 4, verse 16. And I'm going to back it up to 15 so we can get the circumference as to what everything is saying. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region, very important, and shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I want to focus on verse 16. The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Today's message is simply entitled, The Shadow Wars. The Shadow Wars. Father, touch your servant, strengthen that I might give you word as you so desire. Help us to hear what the Spirit says and give us a heart to obey. Lord, let us know that we can no longer fumble and walk in circles as it pertains to the kingdom, but help us to grow up that we might become living sacrifices, holy and acceptable. We thank you in Jesus' name. The Shadow Wars, Shadow Wars. There are two major kingdoms that have been in conflict thousands of years. These kingdoms are older than time as we know it. They are older than man older perhaps than time itself. When we look in Genesis, we see that God created the heaven and the earth. That term heaven is plural. And so in the beginning, sometime backwards before man was introduced, God created the heaven and the earth. And then the word of God says that he, through the breath, of his mouth created spiritual entities. Somewhere after the completion of the heavens and the earth, there was something that took place in heaven. I do not believe that in six days, God created the heaven and the earth, and somewhere between six days, a third of the angels fell. There is obviously time that has passed. 
And when we look at this, we understand then there is a significant amount of time from the time that God creates the angels and the earth because we see right after the seventh day where God rests, there is a serpent in the garden who now seeks to destroy the dominion of man. How did he get there? Where did he come from? Why is it that Eve was not deterred from speaking to something that is called a serpent? The Bible calls him Nakash or shining one. The church must realize that your enemy knows how to deal with light. He knows how and he understands truth and wisdom. Many scholars relay him to be Lucifer of the book of um, Isaiah and Ezekiel. And in many cases, we go no further than looking at Lucifer. But his name in the Hebrew was Helel, which meant light bearer. And if we take it back to the ancient Hebrew, it literally meant the bright star or the brightest star or the most effervescent star. And so this creature then is not something of lowly degree. Hmm. It appears that he had dominion in heaven, but he sought to have more dominion than God. You must be careful about always desiring to get position and fame at any cost. Because it is a spirit that leads you to seek control and to shine beyond the effervescence or the glow of God. Let everything bow its head to the, oh my God, sovereignty and the glory of God. Let the church always remember that there is one Lord, one God above all, one Father in you all and through you all, and only he is worthy to be worshipped. Oh, I wish you could hear me today. It is time out for the lackadaisical service that we render to our God. You may not know how he kept you during the night and how he kept cancer from getting into your cells and, and how he beat back death from you uh, with his covering uh, and that's why every chance you get uh, you've got to learn to lift him up. You've got to learn to praise him because he's worthy in spite of it all. Uh, never let circumstances steal or kill your praise. He is worthy. The church is losing its capacity to love the only being that loves you unconditionally. While we're looking for love in all the wrong places, we have a perfect father who loves us irregardless. He won't look at your size, your shape, your, oh, you don't hear me, the complexion of your skin, the texture of your hair. Mm, that's why you've got to revel in the fact that God loves you. God cares for you. God adores you so much that the Bible says you are the apple of his eye. Mm. Oh, that's something special. God said there's nothing like you uh, before the foundation of the world. Uh, I chose you. Uh, and now I have relegated the spirit spirit to be in you and I have translated you into the beloved. Look at your brothers and sisters and say we've got a daddy in heaven who will not fail. We have a king that has made us queens and princes. We have somebody that's wrapped his arms around us and he will not stop loving us. We are his and he is ours. Give him a prayer. 
And so when we look at these kingdoms, neither of these kingdoms are visible to the naked eye. And so we're dealing with a God that's invisible, but we're dealing with beings that are invisible. There are no circumstances that are just happenstances. Stuff just doesn't happen. There's always a who behind every event that comes to you. And we have become so accustomed of just thinking that uh, it's just an occasion and some things just happen. No, 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 no. Mm, there are two powers working for the hearts of men. One kingdom desires uh, that you come to the Father and be a part of this everlasting kingdom forever. But the other kingdom has an issue with humanity. He has hated humanity from the time that Adam was created out of the dust of the earth. He has hated mankind because mankind was elevated. Oh, I wish you could hear me. Angels have their time and they have their dispensation and in the midst of their time something happened. This renegade spirit looked at himself and said I'm so beautiful, I'm perfect in all my ways and I'm glorious, why should I serve? See there is a spirit that's trying to undermine you and your service to your God. His name was Lucifer. He was the bright star. He was considered to be the morning star. But the Bible says he was the anointed cherub to cover. And so it is believed that before the exodus at the throne of God, there was one being who had governance over the throne of God. He was the protector not that God needed protecting, but God has an entourage, a kingdom constructed because God likes the beings to be involved. Oh, I wish you could hear me. God doesn't really need your praise, but the praise you give to him is for you. Heaven is filled with praising things that night and day throughout eternity holler holy, holy, holy. Uh, there are angels that did not fall and they glorify God because they still do not understand everything about God. They see a greater manifestation than we, but they do not experience the fullness of God. Angels are not omnipresent. And so they can only see what God reveals to them. And they desire to know him more. But this being called Lucifer, the light bearer, he stood behind the throne. One definition for anointed means that your wings are outstretched. Every time you see angels, they have wings that cover themselves and some that are up and some that are out. The fact that he could outstretch himself meant that his glory could be seen. But the flip side of it, uh, he stood behind the very throne of God. When the glory rested, uh, nobody saw him because he was a caretaker of the glory of God. And he began to wonder, why am I in the background when uh, I have so much knowledge? I'm uh, pretty, we would say cute, uh, got it going on. And that's why you have to be careful. Don't ever hook up because somebody has a pretty eye, a pretty complaint because there's nothing more beautiful than the devil himself. Oh my God. And so the Bible says this red dragon, he drew a third of the angels. And the interesting thing that helps me to believe that there was time in between the insurrection is that the term drew is the Greek 
text, uh, suro, and it means to intimidate, uh, to trick, uh, to uh, beguile. Uh, it takes time to convince an angel to leave its God. Oh, you don't hear me. It may not take time to convince you to stop praising him or to convince you I've got other things to do. I'll read my Bible when I read it or to convince you that he's worthy and I'll give him a right now praise just because he's God or to convince you I'm tired but I'm going to clap my hands because I still have a body. I still have life. I still have helped and my God is worthy of all the praise I don't know what you came to do but I came to lift him up he's glorious hallelujah and so when we look at it this being true a third of the celestial host and the Bible says, he said, I will exalt myself above the stars or all the angels. I will walk up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Uh, nobody can stand in the place where the holy fire is. He said, I'm going to stand on the, hallelujah, very altar of incense, the altar of offering. Uh, no, that was reserved for only God. God alone. Tell somebody don't intrude into the things of God where God has to show you who really is God. Oh my God. I've learned to say if the Lord will quit making up your mind that you are the controller and you control life and death. It is by the power of the living God that doors are open. If you knew what I knew hallelujah you would start asking God God how do I do this how do I write this how do I speak this how, how do I take over how do I excel it is God in you that causes you to excel oh my God and so uh, the world of the invisible kingdoms uh, is what we are dealing with today when we look at the woke movement when we look at black lives matter and we look at black lives don't matter and we look at all of these agendas if they do not bring the peace of God then they are constructed with an ulterior motive. The things of God, even when he brings deliverance, brings peace. That's why God made it possible for people who were not Jews to be assimilated into Jewry. The only ones that he said kill them all out were some of the neighboring Canaanites and I don't have time to deal with that but I will say they had tampered with spiritual things and changed their nature. Oh my God. You see back in the garden oh hallelujah Satan was the first murderer that's what Jesus says he murdered from the beginning and he's a father of lies but where did Satan murder who did he kill mm. Oh my God, when we look at Adam and Eve, he entered into the garden to deceive them, to cause them to lose life by separating themselves from their God. It's as if he convinced them to commit suicide. It was because of his tampering that they fell in death from God. And Jesus says, you are the first murderer. Anytime you kill somebody's spirit, 
spirit or you cause them to lose their spirituality God sees it as murder mm. hallelujah and that's why he says it would have been better hallelujah before you tamper with the least of these who praise me and believe in me for you to tie a millstone around your neck and cast yourself into the sea look at somebody and say don't mess with God's children you may not believe I'm where I am and you may not believe that he could love me uh, oh, but everything that has his spirit you have to be careful uh, and so he caused the death of Adam and Eve uh, and he caused them to be ejected out of the kingdom and one thing he understood God caused them all together and God says listen woman what is this thou hast done <laughs> hallelujah and uh, hallelujah first uh, let's let's take it in order uh, man what is this you've done it's the woman that you gave me I've always said women sisters you have to be careful not to be the Jane in Tarzan's crawl <laughs> what do I mean Tarzan was okay when he was swinging with the apes <laughs> when Jane got there he got into all kind of trouble <laughs> amen you can look at me like you want to. Good God. But if it wasn't for Jane, Tarzan wouldn't be caged. If it wasn't for Jane, he wouldn't have to go to the dark regions to find her because she's going to lead an expedition back to the water. Hallelujah. And so it is the woman that uh, Satan comes to. Uh, you have to be careful when you start breaking down the text. There's such a thing as grammar. There is tense. There is spatial tense. There's all kind of things in the word. And Adam was with her. What does that mean? Because with can mean in the proximity. It can mean enjoined by the heart and the mind. It can mean that he was pressing towards her. I find it hard to believe that a devil is talking to your wife and you're sitting there, standing there, listening to everything and you just let her hear the devil and give you a piece of fruit. No, 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 no. There is a reason he goes to the woman. And I don't have time. You know, all of y'all woke now in the church, so we, we're going to move on anyway. But you've got to be careful with this femininity stuff and this masculinity they stopped uh, war against men and women. It is of the devil. God never meant for male and female to be conscribing. That's why he made us differently to complement one another. Oh, you don't hear me. To help one another. And the biblical text says the head of Christ is God. The head of man is Christ. The head of woman is man. I didn't write it. You can roll your eyes, grit your teeth if you want. It's still true anyhow. There is a spirit that is moving from the darkness to divine the unity of man and woman. And so we are fighting hallelujah because we believe we are equal listen I am not equal to a woman she is not equal to me two different things created by God to enhance one another let that spirit of Hecate die there is a goddess spirit in the land to promote sexual and gender fluidity and it is as destructive as anything that the devil can pull let me back up I'm moving too fast mm. And so these kingdoms, these kingdoms, uh, he wars and God says, what is this you've done? It's the woman you gave me. Quit blaming God. Look at your neighbor. Quit blaming God. Somebody told
tore up my rose bush. Look at your neighbor and tell him, quit blaming God. We are living in a world that is on its way to uh, that fiery place. The Bible says it is a place where there will be peril. It is a place where there will be confusion. And we must learn to pray through it. He blamed God for the woman thou gavest me. Oh my God. Woman, what is this you've done? It was the serpent he beguiled me he looks at the snake and the snake says I did it <laughs> come on here never once do you hear him giving an excuse oh my god my god the devil will always own up to what he's done mm. And the Bible says, God looks at him and says, from this day forward, you will eat the dust of the ground. But this is the important thing. He says, and the seed of the woman will crush your head and he will bruise, you will bruise his head heal from that day forward God said there will be a war between humanity and the issuance that comes from the woman oh my god and the devil before they could hardly get out of Eden he rode through Cain to kill his brother because hallelujah he wanted to stop any progression of the deliverer from coming through humanity and so his war has always been to kill out that which will come who will praise him that which will come who will deliver others that which will come who will submit to the will of God and so he began to work in humanity and violence was spread because out of the shadows the darkness began to move to change humanity to make them unfit for the kingdom of God there in hallelujah we find in uh, chapter 6 the Bible says and the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them whatever they wanted now there are two trends of thought I'm just going to leave you with a theological quandary that you can begin to fix number one there is the Sethite theory the theory that the sons of God were the hallelujah righteous Sethites the only problem with this is that the Bible says the B'nai Ha Elohim saw the daughters of men. When we look at the daughters of men, the Sethite theory supposes that only Cain, hear me, only the lineage of Cain had the daughters of men. But the daughters of men, Adam, means everything that came from the lineage of Adam. It included the Cainites and the Sethites. Oh. And then when we look at it, the daughters of Cain, no. The daughters of Seth, no. The daughters of the human race. Whenever you see in the Old Testament, B'nai Ha Elohim, it deals with that which God directly produced, either by creation, and because he didn't overshadow anything, it is only by creation in the Old Testament. Oh, so all B'nai Hath then are the children of God. When we go to the lineage, the Bible records it backwards and says, and Adam, which was the son of God. You were not the son of God by regeneration before you got the Holy Ghost. You were the sons of 
Adam. Made in the image of Adam. That's why we got sin in our flesh today. Because of our forefather, Adam. And so somehow these beings appear to have fallen and did something. I don't want to go into that right now because people will say two different species. How can that happen? Well, I'll just give you this. If you look at what man has done, being able to create hybrids, there are things called ligers where they, hallelujah, have taken the tiger and the lion and combined their DNA. And a liger is much huger than a regular tiger or a lion. And then there is a tigon mixed with tiger and, uh, oh, y'all don't hear me, lion. And so they have created through genetic manipulation all types of hybrid animals. You've got ocelots mixed with leopards and you got leopards mixed with Puma. You got, uh, hallelujah, a horse mixed with a mule that produces a donkey. <laughs> and so if man has the capacity and technology to create hybrids, uh, what do you think about heaven? Heaven is more than a place with fat cherub babies and beings sitting on clouds plucking hearts. They have a technology that goes beyond the technology of man. In heaven, you see them step into fire and be transported. In the scripture, we see where they just appear out of nowhere. In the scripture, we see wheels in the middle of a wheel. We see sparks coming out that have the life of the creatures. We have fiery swords. We see chariots of fire, technology that shows to us that angels knew more than just wearing long dresses and singing nearer my God to thee and so somehow hallelujah the whole population became polluted and in that state they began to do hallelujah things that God did not desire. Well, Bishop, I still don't believe it. Well, let's go. He says, as in the days of Noah, so shall the days of the end be. So who are the Sethites? Are we the Sethites? Mm, come on here. Because there's going to be a total mingling again. What happened in Noah's days will happen today. Mm. But what do we see? And I'm just going to digress for a moment. We see these flying saucers that are pulling people and experimenting on them. Hallelujah. And in many cases, they're experimenting on their reproductive organs. Oh, I wish you could hear and I wish I had time. Is this a spiritual entity? Not from Omega-3, but from a dimension that's coming into our world to now populate the earth again with a hybrid species. All right, let's move on. I, I see you haven't thought about that. Let's move on. And so he creates confusion. And the confusion is so bad that God destroys the whole earth. This doesn't seem like God's character because he destroys the old, the feeble, the young, babies, teenagers. They all die in a flood. What would make a loving God without regard destroy every human but eight. I want you to think about that. It's not that God gets mad and destroys folk because they didn't give him a praise. No. The Bible says that God says all souls are mine. 
and before the foundation of the world he loved us for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish God loves humanity but something drove him to destroy every living thing on the face of the earth and so we see all through the Bible where the devil is using people to corrupt mankind in chapter 11 we find the man by the name of Nimrod quit praising stuff that you don't understand Nimrod the great hunter you have to know what that means biblically and the Bible says he becomes a mighty man in the Septuagint it says he becomes a Nephilim somehow he changes himself he rallies the people and they say let us build brick brick had never existed before they have a technology they are now building something for a purpose. Mm. They build the tower and this is their problem. The Bible says they build it to make themselves a name. They are saying now the next time if God desires to flood the earth we'll go into the tower and we'll be safe. And God said bless your pointed head. No you won't. And he breathes and their tongues are scattered. Now they're all speaking different languages and can't communicate and they're scattered. Through their there are many different things that are introduced to man. They introduce the Egyptian system of religion, the Ugaritic system of religion, the Akkadian system of religion. And so all of these systems are now shifting because mankind is no longer living together. Religions were produced to take worship off of God, to direct it to a false deity because if we will fall away from God, God, according to those demons, must desire to destroy us. But God finds in Ur of Chaldees, Abram, and says, get thee up out of thy land, and I'll take you to a place where I'll show you. He now has to find someone willing to allow him to work through humanity. The Bible is not a reproduction that was copied from an ancient text, but rather the scripture is an apologetic text where God finally finds someone who will write down, no, it was not Inky, it was not raw, it was not Jupiter, it was not chaos and Gaia that created the earth, but he says, in the beginning, God. He now sets the record straight. It's not that they reproduced a text from some heathenistic colony, but they are now because they were aware of those beliefs. Abram lived right in Ur of Chaldees. Abram's folk worshipped false gods and idols and so God rode through Abram and said Abram I'm going to covenant with you because you're the only one that I can find that will have faith and allow because I'm going to start initiating my number one plan to take back 
the earth. Oh my God. And so he finds Abram. That He says, Abram, I'm going to bless you. But what I need you to do, and I'm moving quickly, take your only son, take him to Mount Moriah, which many scholars identify as Golgotha's Hill. Mm. If you don't study your Bible, you don't know what Golgotha was. It was the place where Jesus was crucified. He said, take your son to Moriah on the highest hill and offer him as a sacrifice. Now, here comes Abram, but God, you've told me, I can imagine what's going through his mind. You said that, that my son will be the father of many nations. He's going to bear many ones who through my name will have faith. And so he takes the son. Quit looking. Well, you can look at it, but always remember, go to the text. Abram and his son. Isaac was not a little eight-year-old, but it is believed he was 30 years old. He could have knocked the old man down the hill. But here we see a type and the shadow of a father giving his only begotten son and the son submitting to death. Mm. He goes with two other people and he has the wood and the fire. Abram and Isaac ascend, says the other ones, wait here and we'll be back. We know he believed that if I kill this child, God has to raise him up to keep his promise. Now, are you not hearing him? You must understand if God allows the devil to take something, his promise is it is his good pleasure to give you the good things of heaven. Tell somebody it's coming back around. It's coming back around. God cannot lie. If something bad is happening, he's simply testing me. Can I praise him in the fire? If you got to cry while you're in the fire, just cry. But realize he will take you out one way or the other. Either the flames will send you home or God will lessen the fire's ability to... Oh, my God. And so, he says, we're coming back again. Isaac turns to his daddy and says, well, we have the wood, we have the fire, now where's the lamb? And Abram says, very, very, hallelujah, carefully, the Lord will provide himself a lamb. It didn't just mean that he's going to get a lamb, but uh, if you read between the words, he's saying the Lord himself will be the lamb. Oh, you don't hear me. I don't want to get into the Godhead thing because folks still don't understand it. Trinitarians don't understand it. If God is simplistic, then he does not have parts. Oh, you don't hear me. If God is eternal, then time doesn't infect, uh, affect him. Who is Jesus? He made statements, I am, before Abraham was. He's identifying unity with God the Father. In the beginning was the word, logos. Logos is a dissertation. It is a lengthy discussion. It is a truth. It is word that proceeds from the mind and the mouth in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God the same in the beginning was with God and all things were made by him who is the him goes back to Logos all things were made by Jesus but I thought in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth the term uses Elohim so which is it is it the father or is it the son I'll let you wrestle with that and so the Bible says, uh, digress for a moment, I got a little bit of time, digress, we will never fully understand God 
his ways are past our finding out while we're arguing as trinitarians and oneness now i don't believe that jesus was the archangel michael so let me just preference that and i don't believe that god progresses he is the same forever yesterday and forevermore but I do understand that when we talk about God, there's no other being like him. Oh my God, the Bible says, hear ye, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. If you want to get it in the Hebrew, he says, Shema, O Israel, Yehovah Elohim is Echad, Yehovah. And so he is one Lord. And so to presume that we know the nature of that which which cannot be known is a great presumption on all of our parts. All I'm required to do is believe that the Son came, believe there's a Father, and that through the Son we have eternal life. Oh, y'all don't hear me. I still don't know what a spirit is, and you don't need that. The Bible says spirit in the Old Testament, Ruach, in the New Testament, Numa, breath, blast, breeze, what is it? Is is God just air? No, he's much more. And so there's more to this God than Harvard Theological Seminary can figure out, Fuller Seminary, anybody. He's God and he's in a class all by himself. Quit trying to know what you can never know. How did God begin? The Bible says he never began, always was. Our mind doesn't understand and so we go with the scripture mm, he is the everlasting father the mighty god the prince of peace what's his name jesus is he the father the bible says and god was revealed in flesh and his name shall be called emmanuel god with us tabernacling amongst us I don't understand it but I know that he is oh my god and so when we look at the text I'm getting ready to preach when we look at the text we see that all through the Old Testament you see these individuals trying to stop Abram trying to stop the Israel because the promise is coming God said I'm going to take back the world and the devil will be defeated once and for all and through this let me help you through this no spiritual entity knew anything about the church the Bible says it was an eternal mystery because if the devil knew it he would kill it out before he came. The Bible says if they knew when they were crucifying the Son of God afresh that he would bring forth a troop, a tribe, a family filled with his spirit, they never would have crucified him. Look at somebody and says his death brought you into this world. His death provided power for men who would say yes. His death opened up a new realm for sons of God who had the name, who had the spirit, who could now hold back the powers of darkness. Look at somebody and say, I'm so glad you're a part of this number. Mm. Oh, I wish I had a church that was heaven bound. Uh, look at somebody else and say, I'm so glad you found Jesus. Uh, but I'm glad that I found him most of all. Oh, my God, my God. And so when we look at it, uh, we move. And let's go down, let's go down. The Bible says giants populated the earth. It is believed that these giants are remnants uh, of this connection between the sons of God and the daughters of men. I used to believe that and I uh, went to some of my elders and they said, well, no, 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 no. But I've always believed that in the back of my mind because when you look at what they call collective conscious, 
I don't hold to it the way Carl Gustav Jung did, that it is a universal mind. But I believe in collective consciousness that uh, every human being understands spiritual things at the most essential level. Why do all ancient, oh my God, countries have pantheons that have gods and demigods? It seems to be everywhere. It is in Egypt, it is uh, Babylon, it is the American Indians, it's in every culture, the Greek, uh, it's as in all of them have the same understanding that these gods, and if you look at them, these gods are never pure. Zeus was the biggest rascal of them all, uh, and uh, Odin was a rascal, and so they were not gods, but it appears that they may have been fallen angels uh, who sought to corrupt man. Just hold that. Hold that just for a minute. Mm. When we go further and we look at it, we see that these giants were in the land. And God said, kill them out. Don't even take their stuff. Kill the babies. Kill the women. Kill the children. Because the land is defiled with them. Why? Why? I'll let you do that research. Mm, and the Bible says that they were dispossessed. Mm, my God. But it is believed that these fallen beings, the giants, they had an excursion and they, hallelujah, they moved into other lands. And I'm just going to hit this briefly. There are giant skulls all over the earth. And so it is believed that there was a giant diaspora where they moved from one place to another. They found giants here in America, in Peru, in Egypt, all over the place. People that were nine foot, ten foot, and larger. Oh my, just, just Google it. You Google everything else. Tinder, mm -hmm, Facebook, uh, mm -hmm. All right, let's move on. Just Google it and you will find giants. And so when we look at it, he told them he was going to destroy them. He gives them the land, but Israel is not faithful over the land. And so he establishes a kingdom, a kingdom of priests. The priests are not faithful. And it seems like the power of darkness has won. Darkness has killed out the only people who are the preservers of the word and preservers of the name of God. And then comes what they call, some say 200, some say the 400 silent years. God wasn't silent, he was still working behind the scenes. And then in the process of time, here comes a little maiden girl, 16 years old perhaps. And the Bible says that God sends an angel and he says, you're going to have a child. Well, how can this be? I, I, I'm a virgin. I know not man. And he says, the Holy Ghost will overshadow you. Now, don't put your mind in the gutter to believe what some people believe that God had sex with Mary. No, 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 no. We've got to be careful of everything we believe. He overshadows and the creator then through his will fertilizes. Hallelujah. And over and the same God becomes, hallelujah, materialized in flesh. Oh my God, he grows up, he does whatever. And here the war starts again. The war in the Old Testament was an overt world war that you could see with weapons and giants and fighting. But in the New Testament, now the powers of darkness have a very themselves. Mm. You never hear of demons being cast out in the Old Testament. Why? Because in the Old Testament,
Testament, they used physical apparitions. And now they're going to reset the plan. We'll move in to torture man through the invisible demons. Demons and angels, fallen angels, are not the same. Demons are disembodied spirits. Demons had their bodies destroyed in the judgment. And that's why they find no peace unless they get in you or somebody close to you. They want to enjoy your lust at a hyper level. Oh, come on here. And so we see Jesus, and Jesus comes, and he's casting out devils, he's healing the sick, he's raising the dead, and Matthew comes and says, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light. Now, I'm almost finished, but I want you to hear this. The term darkness is the word skia, and it deals with shade, error, or gloom. It deals with suffering. It deals with cessation. It is the gloom of darkness that causes our depression, that causes men to lose hope. And then he goes, and now, now hear this, the people which sat in darkness, they are positioned in a world that's filled with death, destruction, and gloom. And the Bible says they saw a great light. And to them, hear this, which sat in the region, and here he's saying now they're sitting positionally. He uses the word Korah. It is a place that is empty of all life and empty of all light. It is a place where one inhabits. It is a place that one lives and dwells and functions. He said they now which sat in the region and two things. They're in a region which is dimensionally filled with dark stuff. And then he says, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death. Very interesting because for shadow, it again is the word that deals with something that overtakes and covers and something that uh, blots out something that causes confusion and something that causes blindness he says now there were those who were shaded over and they only saw an outline. I, I thank you, Holy Ghost. I got it memorized. Let's move. And so he goes on and he says, now those who sat in darkness and the shadow of death. Shadows are only produced when something is blocking out the portion of the sun. Wherever you see a shadow, the shadow will be a silhouette of the figure that's standing in the light. Oh, you don't hear me. And so when we speak of shadow wars, we speak of the devil trying to stand between you and God. He brings circumstances that will block the light and that will cover you with the thing that's blocking the light. Have you ever stood under a tree for shame? The shade looks like the tree. It is the shade that is stopping the light from shining on you. And so shadow wars then are the things that the enemy uses to stand between you and your God. And if you have half a wit's discernment, you can recognize the silhouette that is trying to cover you because it 
cannot produce a shadow unless it stands in the light. And the all-consuming light of God will always reveal the entity that's trying to shadow you. And so to know what's fighting you, just look at the shadow and you can say, God, depression. God, lack. God, anger. God, fear. And so when you deal with the shadow that's trying to cover you, it is trying to invade your mind to produce an image after the entity that's trying to keep you out of the graces of God. And so when the devil stands, God shines the light and all you see is the shadow. All you see is fear. All you see, I don't know if I'm be able to keep my job. I don't know if I'm going to have enough money to afford this. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But one thing we do know, and that is God is a provider. One thing we do know, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. One thing we do know, he is a deliverer. And those that bring trouble to you, pray for them, but they have not gotten away. The shadow wars, the enemies hiding behind the brightness of the word of God and yet trying to put an impression on you. But he did not figure that in you is the bright and morning star. The morning star has risen. The day star has risen in your heart. And every shadow that comes, all you've got to do is step back and let the day star shine. There is such a thing where the light of the day will lose the power of the shadow. The light of God is perfect light and no shadow can exist in his presence. Every enemy has to bow. Every knee has to bow to the glory of God that he is Lord all by himself. You've got to trust in your God and say, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. I reject this feeling. I reject this mindset. I reject this loneliness because you're always with me. And as a matter of fact, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Get thee behind me and go to praising your God. Doesn't matter what you're in. Doesn't matter what you feel. All you've got to do is lift him up, magnify him, and he will make a way. Tell somebody, you've got the victory. You've got the power because God in you, Jesus in you, the hope of glory. Somebody give him a praise. The devil may be invisible, but God sees it all. While you don't see it, you can miss it. There are angels. There is God. The devil can't do any more than God allows. Tell somebody, I've got angels watching over me. And if they miss it and they can't handle it, I've got God. Give him a praise. Hallelujah. Can I share with you how much God really cares for you? The Bible says every hair on your head is numbered. 
I don't know how many hairs grew and fell out and grew and fell out, but God said, you're so special. I keep track of every hair on your head and every tear you cry. I know it. I've kept them in the bottle. Listen, God will not allow the devil to get victory over you. You might feel his sting, but the resurrecting God will lift you up turn you around and fix every circumstance let him do it what is the importance of understanding god you got to help me you got to help me i need your strength what is the uniqueness of understanding that the devil hides in shadows? What is the uniqueness? This is the uniqueness that if he hides in the shadow, the Bible says that God is absolute light. There is no shadow of turning. And in him, there is no darkness at all. Uh, uh, you, you didn't read between the lines. If God shows up, all darkness has to flee. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The first thing that light does to darkness, it causes it to compress itself, to stop moving. It's got to hide under something that will give it a shadow. And when absolute light comes in, not even the bench can hide darkness. It will clear the room of everything that is evil. And that's why he says that God dwells in the midst of praise when the people of God give God their all and the glory comes then God can deliver from anything we just gotta know how to loose and so the goal the goal is we got to get God in our gatherings we spend too much time singing songs that nobody wants to sing. Come on here. We got to have a testimony service. No, we don't. Sometimes all the time we got, because after the song, people have shut down. And if the song was not good and orchestrated, people shut down in the middle of it. We have got to keep the word so we know how to navigate in this wicked world because its presence is spreading but the power that's in the church is being abated because the enemy is rocking us to sleep my warning to you is not to sleep on the job during this time when darkness is ravaging the world the educational system the banking system church we've got to wake up and glorify our God. Hear me. And I'm just about through. God, now just let me talk to him for a minute. God, you've got to heal this body. I'm not, I'm not used to having a little bit of energy. Oh, Y'all don't hear me. The time is evil. And it's too late in the day to cool off. Can I help you with some of the stuff we say and it just gets under my skin? Uh, we'll quote what Jesus said, uh, or what they say in the book of Revelation. I would that you be hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. And so we say, you know, you gotta be either on fire or just be totally cold. To just, that's not what the text means. In the text, the Hebrew, their, oh God help me, their persuasion, what's the word I'm looking for, culture, they would, when it was cold, give you something heated to warm you. When it was hot, they would give you a cool drink. 
And so what Jesus is saying, you've got to learn to accommodate me. Have you come to the mind that you're going to make me feel welcome, whatever is happening? He's not talking about you being cold. Why would Jesus want you cold? He doesn't want you lukewarm. He wants you being able to satisfy him and make his presence welcome. Can you make his presence welcome today? Hallelujah. Oh my God, my God, my God. I'm getting ready to sit down. I don't have the energy to my cheerleading days left as of January 6th. January 6th is when I contracted COVID. So my, my, my cheerleading days, no more, no more. Give me a J, give me a living. If you don't got the J, you can't give me a J. Oh, you don't hear me. You got to stir some stuff up for you and understand how to let God work for you. Because I'm gonna tell you something. The time is coming and you can talk about preachers all they want. But preachers, they get the load that is so much heavier than yours. Because they hurt when you hurt, they hurt when the family hurt, they hurt when they hurt, and when they hurt, nobody else know they hurting, and very few people are praying for them when they hurting because they're concerned about their own hurt. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If I could, I would grab you, say praise him, praise him. We'd have one of those old time uh, tarrying sessions. Come on, come on, come on, come on. But, but this is a different age. Because you all would look at me and tell me, mm, I'm trying, trying to make me speak in tongues. I know I got the Holy Ghost. You might have had it, but with that evil attitude, something has happened. Because you should want to make sure that you're in touch with your Christ. Well, Bishop, we tired. Tired of doing what? Now, you done sat home for almost two years. What you tired for? Don't even go to the grocery store anymore. You just dial them up. When will it be here? Serving God takes strength and energy. God doesn't want a dead sacrifice. And the greatest sacrifice we can see with the widow that had the might. That represents so many things. We just attributed she didn't have much money. She might not have had much joy. Maybe she didn't have much strength. If she doesn't have the money, she doesn't have the food to sustain her energy. How many of you have missed a meal for the week? You know where I'm going with this. I'm getting ready to sit down. You know where I'm going with this, right? So none of us are so malnourished that we can't give God what's his. Balance is giving to God what is God's. Now everything else you can give to Caesar, Peaser, Pizer, Pfizer, whoever, but give to God what is his. Well, Bishop, what belongs to him? I'm glad you asked that question. Turn to somebody and say, I'm glad you asked that question. The Bible said you were bought with a price and you belong to God. Therefore, glorify him in your members whose members you are. Tell somebody, you belong to God. Everything you are on is God's. And I'm not making a pitch because pastors will turn this around. That's why you need to give $100 in the offering. Listen, you got to be wise. You'll know when God is asking for something because you feel compelled to give or you feel compelled to fight with God when you're in the flesh. But you'll know when God is asking for something because the spirit in the room will be one of compassion. Now, I want you to stand. And I'm taking my time. 
So we might be down to eight folk next week, but I'm taking my time. And I'm taking my time because I don't know what the devil is going to do to you when you leave here. And if I don't put everything I can into you, you're not going to be able to stand his attacks. Hear me. You are involved in the shadow war. The shadow war deals with spies, deals with secret operands. And so in many cases, the devil is warring in your mind against you. He's going to tell you, you're too fat, you're ugly, nobody loves you, no love in the church. I'm going to dispel all of that mess in a minute. You're not important. You'll never be anything. How are you going to succeed? You don't have an education. You don't have this. You don't have that. Nobody's going to give you a chance. He will show you everything negative to get you to see the negative. And that's why the Bible says, whatever is lovely, good, of good report, if there's virtue in it, he said, talk about that, think about that. I don't have an education. No, I don't. But I do have the God who is all knowledge. And in the Bible, the Bible says, aren't these men ignorant men? But we can tell they had been with Jesus. The word ignorant is the word that deals with somebody who's a buffoon, an idiot. They call the apostles idiots, but they say, but we can tell they've been with somebody because they're talking like they got good sense. Tell somebody the best education is from God. Oh, you're not hearing me. You're not hearing me. I know too many people that got their degrees and don't know their perspective arenas in their education. Quit running after the paper, and if you're going to get something, get some knowledge and wisdom and bring it back to the house of God. Don't come back here smacking your lips, talking about, I, I, I is post humeritus. I don't care if you're post deteritus. Listen, we need some folk that understand the kingdom needs help. Are you all hearing me? You young folk, when you get an education, don't, don't grit your teeth and spit in the church's face, but bring it back. Uh, you ugly. The Bible says he beautifies the meek with salvation. Get meek and then you'll start looking beautiful. Meek means gentle. Listen, I don't care what you think about me. And you shouldn't either. You know if you're fat, just be happy fat. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I don't care what you think about my hair. You don't comb it, buy me shampoo, and you're not going to help me get it together. Nobody loves you wrong. For God so loved the world that he gave. No love in the church wrong. For God is love. They tell me that you all believe the Holy Ghost is God. So if the Holy Ghost is in you, then love is in you. And if you're in the church, then love is in the church. You just got to find out how to connect to it. And stop running around looking like your name is Morticia or Uncle Fester of the Adams family. Y'all hear what I'm saying? You have to know how to connect with it. The End Time Apostolic Christian Holiness Church would like to thank you for listening to the Anointed Word of God. For a copy of this message or to receive information about the Apostolic Christian Holiness Ministry, contact us at 614-274-8217 or write to us at 650 South Warren Avenue, Columbus, Ohio 43204 or you can visit us on the, at www.n-time.org. We are conveniently located off of I-70 West, exit 98A, just five minutes west of downtown. Thank you for listening, and until next time, may God bless you 
and keep you 